Our speaker today is my good friend and colleague, Fred Hyde, who is Associate Professor in Philosophy and in the Philosophy Neuroscience Psychology Program, and he's also the uh, Director of Linguistics. Brett received his Ph.D. from Rutgers University in 2001, one of the leading schools in linguistics, and was appointed here as a assistant professor in 2005. I might note that although there was a linguistics program at that time, there was no actual linguistics major, and Brett really was the prime mover in the development of that major in 2008. A very successful major indeed, by the way, so we're grateful to him for, for that. His book, Layering and Directionality, Metrical Stress and Optimality Theory, was published in 2016, and he's at work on another monograph on stress to be published by Cambridge University Press. That is, of course, stress in language, not the kind that we all occasionally feel in everyday life. He's produced many journal articles and book chapters on a wide range of topics in his area of specialization, which is theoretical phonology. I want to add that Brad is a highly regarded teacher. He has, by my count, supervised 31 honors theses or research projects and has also served on honors theses committees more than 20 times. For any of us who have done this, we know that this is a lot of work. So this is the kind of dedication to our students, I think, that we should all admire. Today, Brett's topic is rhythm and natural language. Please welcome Brett Hyde. Thank you. I want to I want to warn you up front that uh, I almost never use PowerPoints. Real linguists use handouts. <laughs> they never use PowerPoints. So this there's potential for things to go wrong here. I just want you to know that up front. I think all the bugs were worked out, but I can't guarantee it. All right. See, that was one. There we go. All right. Um, I want to talk about uh, Rhythm and natural language today, but first I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, um, just language in general um, because it's so important. So this talk is is going to be uh, the kind of stuff I do uh, is fairly technical. Um, I've tried to make it not too technical. There's been some great examples that have been around for a long time that have been pretty successful, and we're going to try to stick to those. Um, but I, I've always felt for a long time it's important to keep in mind um, when we get uh, focused on these technical issues about how language works, it's always important to keep in mind exactly what language is. Um, and it, it's really hard to, hard to tell you. Um, are really hard to express in a way that at first might not put you to sleep. So if I tell you, if I tell you that uh, language is is the fundamental means um, through which human beings encode and transmit information, that that doesn't sound that interesting. It sounds like maybe you know it's. It's a list of social security numbers, or the information might be the last um, 12 credit card statements that you got. Uh, it's, I mean, it could be that kind of information. But it's also, um, I mean, it could be grocery lists. But it's also arguments. It's discussions. It's stories, right? It's truths about the world. It's lies about the world. It's all those things. And because it's the fundamental way that we encode and transmit information as human beings, um, 
And because it's so effective at doing that, um, it, it's really, as, as my, I kind of paraphrase my colleague John Ba, it is a fundamental aspect of every significant human endeavor. All right, so we, I mean, we even just look around this university. Um, if it's not for language, we don't have this university. There's no point. If we don't have language, we don't have lectures on chemistry. We don't have lectures on biology. We don't have lectures in philosophy. Right? So we just don't have lectures at all. We don't have books um, on mathematics. We don't have books on psychology. There just are no books, period, if we don't have language. Now, there's a couple of properties of language that make it particularly effective as a means of encoding and trans, uh, transmitting information. Um, one of these is creativity. Um, creativity, you can actually break this down into two sub-properties. One is, one of the sub-properties is openness. And openness basically means that we can always make new words. We can always make new morphemes. All right? If we want to talk about something and we don't have a word for it, we can borrow one, or we can make one up. It, language uh, always permits that possibility. The second important property of language is recursion. Recursion is important because it allows us to embed sentences within sentences. It allows us to embed phrases within other phrases. And uh, basically what recursion means is we can always make a more complex sentence. We can always make a longer sentence. Okay. We put these two together, openness and recursion, and what that means is language is basically adequate to talk about anything that we might want to talk about. If we have to, we can make up a new word. If we need to, we can make a more complex sentence or a longer sentence. The second really important property of language that makes it such an effective, uh, makes it such an effective way of, of encoding information or um, moves it beyond other systems that we see of communication uh, in other species. And that's displacement. And often this is overlooked. Displacement is really neat. What displacement means is we aren't limited to talking about here and now. Okay? We can talk about the past. We can talk about the future. We can talk about things going on in Hawaii. Probably the weather's better. All right. We can talk about things going on on the other side of the world. We can talk about things that are abstract. They don't have to be concrete. We can talk about things that are imaginary. All right. We can really talk about anything. And that's what makes language so great. Well, um, today we're going to be focusing on um, something that's... Uh, um, it's a little lower level. It's more important in actual production of language, getting it out in its spoken form, or even in a manual form, although that won't be the focus today. And that is uh, rhythm in language. Now, the place where we find rhythm in language is really in stress and accent patterns. Sorry, we're not going to get to that yet. First, um, before we do stress and accent patterns, I want to give you a, a little, I want to introduce you a few, to you a few uh, symbols that we're going to be using, the International Phonetic Alphabet. When you become a linguist, the first thing you do is you have to learn to spell again. You may think that's not that great, because it wasn't that fun the first time around. But it's a lot better the second time around. It's a little bit easier. The, thing, the things that you have to worry about, um, the consonants are, are mostly going to be the same. There's a few new consonant symbols. That big, long, swoopy S type thing is sh, like the first sound in ship. That combination of a T and the S-like thing is ch, the first sound in chip. And then the sound that we spell as ng at the end of words is really usually one sound. And we have that 
we represent that as an N with a hook. Now these will come up once in a while. You don't have to remember too much, I'll remind you. Um, but the thing that really varies a lot uh, from you know, the, the sounds we typically associate with these symbols are our vowels. So the vowels would be more like, if you know Spanish, maybe more like Spanish vowels or vowels in one of the European languages. So, so the sound that we say I, that, or the symbol that we've named I actually sounds like E, capitalized like I. The symbol that we call E actually sounds more like A. The epsilon is E. That is called ash. That's an A sound. Um, this one is an A sound like in pot. This one is put. This is uh, but it's pretty long and loud. Uh, in put. Um, this sounds almost the same, but it's much shorter and softer. Uh, okay, so this is uh, really hard. Uh, this is kind of weak. Uh, okay, they sound pretty similar. Um, so we'll, we'll see a few of these symbols every once in a while. I'll remind you what they mean. Um, but these are, these are the key ones that are, are different than the ones in English. OK, so stress and accent. When I first started off with stress and accent, I think um, most people's familiarity with this is, I'm going to get on the internet here. I'm going to go to the Oxford English Dictionary. And I learned something already about the Oxford English Dictionary as I uh, as I um, was preparing the talk. And that is, come on, that it doesn't have a lot of the cool words. <laughs> it's just inadequate in a lot of ways. It's really big, and so you would think it would have all the cool words, but it doesn't. Anybody know what a chafalaya is? Oh, you can't see it? A chafalaya, sorry. A chafalaya is a uh, river in Louisiana. That should be in the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> An important river, the fifth largest by discharge in the United States. OK, um, but it has others. We have other words that we can use, um, like Passamaquoddy. And you would think maybe it wouldn't have that either. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Is that good? It does have Passamaquoddy. So Passamaquoddy is the name of a, um, it, I don't think it's the name of a river, but it's the name of a bay. And it's the name of a Native American tribe. Uh, they do have Passamaquoddy. Passamaquoddy is probably my favorite word in English. It's borrowed, but it's still English. So um, despite being inadequate in many ways, the OED very confidently tells you where the accents are in this word. Can you see that? So here in Passamaquoddy, this is the IPA symbol for, you see where I'm pointing? This is the IPA symbol for primary stress, right there. And this is the IPA symbol for secondary stress, OK? And really good dictionaries will, will show that. Some will show you even tertiary stresses, primary, secondary, and, and tertiary. We can go look at another word like revolutionary. Whoops, revolutionary. There it is. Here's US. And it says that it has three stresses. The primary stress is on this syllable, lu. Here's that sh I told you about. Remember that sound? And that upside down uh. There's a secondary stress on here on re at the beginning of the word. There's also a secondary stress right here on na. How do they know this? Do you know where the primary stresses and secondary stresses are? 
How do you know where the stresses are? What are the stress syllables in a word? What does that mean? Anybody have any guesses? I'll be a little bit interactive here. What does it mean? If, you have, if you're accented in English, what does, what does that mean? You're a syllable and you're accented. What's special about you? What, what? Sometimes the tone is higher. Sometimes other times it's lower, though. What else could it be? Louder. Sometimes it's louder. Yeah, so the way you said that, that, that there, there were some differences there. There were some differences in maybe how long it was, maybe how loud it was. And sometimes that matters. Sometimes uh, it doesn't, though. All right, so I'm going to give you some, some things for English that can indicate stress, but don't always. And this is a good example, or this is usually what represents uh, or gives us the best idea of where the primary stress is the nuclear intonation tone. So different languages use pitch in different ways. Um, some languages use pitch as basically extra letters. Right? So in, in Chinese dialects, you might have the same sequence of sounds like ma, like m, a, ma. And you might put different pitches on that. And depending on what pitches you put on, with that sequence of sounds, you'll get a different word. In English, we don't use it quite like that, but we do use it um, to distinguish different meanings, but more at the sentential level. So um, we have tunes, changes in pitches that are associated with statements, declarative statements. And we have other tunes that are associated with other things, like questions. <coughs> so. Um, these tunes are really, really closely connected to where the primary stress in a word is. If it's a longer phrase, these tunes actually cover phrases. Each of them has like this big main important word. And where, how the tune is associated with the phrase uh, is really closely connected to where the primary stress is in that big important word. So the declarative tune starts out mid. With a, with a mid-tone. The tones are relational. The pitches are relational. It goes high, and then it goes low again. And that is just a simple declarative statement. The question tune is starts out mid, and then it goes low, and then it goes high again. Now, the, the, tune, the tone with the little asterisk by it is the uh, nuclear tone. It's the one that gets associated with the primary stress. So if we have a word like reconciliation, and we say it as a statement, like just a declaration, like somebody wants to know what's the word of the day, and I say reconciliation, then it's associated with this tune. Reconciliation is associated with this tune. And it starts off mid, and it goes, whoops, it goes high on the primary stress. And then it goes low. So we go rec reconciliation, right? Goes up on A. That's where the primary stress is. Now, when we have the question tune, um, it's the low tone, actually, that gets mapped to the primary stress. So we have reconciliation. The primary stress is on A. But with the question tune, it goes down on A. So if I'm not quite sure what the word of the day is, so if Mark asked me what the word of the day is, and I'm not sure. I said reconciliation. Then it goes down on the A and pops back up. Okay. Reconciliation. Reconciliation, like that. Okay. So um, it's not so much the particular tone or the particular pitch that's important here. What is important is where that that key pitch in the tune goes. That's always associated with the primary stress. Now, sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low, 
but it, the key to the key part of the tune is always associated with the primary stress. We'll just look at another word for fun: revolutionary. So in this case, um, the primary stress is on Lou. There are secondary stresses on Re and Ne, like we saw, but the primary stress associates with Lou. So when I say revolutionary as a statement, what's the word of the day? Revolutionary. Up on Lou and then back down. Okay. If I'm not sure about it, what's the word of the day? Revolutionary? Down on Lou and then back up. Okay, just like this. All right. So the primary stress is easiest to, easiest to identify. Um, it has this significant uh, coincidence with pitch uh, with the pitch excursions, the key the key pitch changes in our intonational tunes. What about the others? They don't participate in this, or if, with some tunes they do, not with these. They don't participate in these tunes. How do we know what the primary, or how do we know where the other stresses are? Here the cues are a little more mixed. And I will, I will tell you, English is one of the languages that Mark stressed the best. So where English, we see some, some uh, lack of indication in English about where the stresses are. English is really pretty good at it. Other languages mark it even less well or even less clearly. So, um, one way to find uh, where stresses are is in patterns of vowel reduction. Where stresses go affects what vowels you get in different words in English. So, in stress syllables, we call these um, full vowels, things like E, A, 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 U, from left to right. E, A, 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 U. This A uh, occurs in unstressed syllables. So if you see one of these full vowels here, there's a pretty good chance that the syllable is stressed to some degree. If you see that reduced vowel or hear that reduced vowel, uh, really short though, not the way I just said it, like uh, it's really tiny, short, then odds are that that's a stressless syllable. Okay, and we can see this patterns. So here's another great English word, abracadabra. Um, and it looks like, just based on the spelling, all those vowels should be the same. But it turns out they're not. Right? So you have a, uh, uh, a, a, a. Abracadabra. A, 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 a. Now the as are in the stress syllables. And the us are in the stressless syllables. So the primary stress is on da, and there's a secondary stress on a at the beginning. Okay? I'll give you a couple more examples. A chafalaya. A chafalaya has four vowels. In this case, the first one is unstressed. It starts out a, uh, and then you get a, uh, and then a, uh, i, a diphthong, i, and then a. Uh. Okay? Susquehanna. Susquehanna um, starts out uh, like the stressed, uh, the big, powerful uh, like in putt, and then goes to soft uh, and then ah, uh, uh. So you have alternating stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed. Okay? And that's a good way to tell when it works out nicely. There are exceptions, though, which makes it problematic in some cases. So the E sound at the end of words, like in pity, happy, E doesn't reduce at the end of words. It always stays E in English. O at the end of words stays O. It doesn't reduce, even in unstressed syllables. Like in Oslo or Tableau, it doesn't reduce. It stays O. So it doesn't help us there. Uh, I, the I sound generally, that capital I means I in linguistics. The last two vowels in linguistics clearly are I. One is stressed, the other is unstressed. So in gwis or gwi, it's a stressed i. In ix, 
unstressed. So that is not. I moved on too fast. Did I get them all? No? Okay. I did warn you. R colored vowels and R generally doesn't change when the syllable is stressed or unstressed. So if I have a word like shirker, one of those is stressed and one is unstressed. The first one is stressed, the second one is unstressed. So the particular vowel we have there, these are R colored vowels, or vowels that are influenced by R or that sound like R. Sometimes they're just R. R can act like a vowel. Um, the R for uh, American English, sorry, the R for, for English, the thing we think of as R actually, er, uh, I should have pointed this out, is, is written with an upside down R. Okay? So um, if it acts like a vowel, we put a little line under it. That's the little line that you see under it. This is called syllabic R or an R colored vowel. So in shirker, we have two er sounds. The first one is accented, the second one isn't. So vowel reduction doesn't help us here. Other things um, that pattern with stress are aspiration. Aspiration is another thing. Now, aspiration is what it sounds like. It's a big puff of air. So if you take your hand, everybody has to do this. This is fun. <laughs> this is the fun part of linguistics. If you take your hand and you say, pat, pat, you feel that big puff of air with the P, pat. That's aspiration. If you say um, something like clipper, clipper, you feel a big puff of air with the P, clipper. No big puff of air. Not like, it, I mean, there's air there, but not like pat, right? The big puff of air is, is aspiration. Sounds in front of the mouth especially have a lot of aspiration. You kind of lose it as you go to the back of the mouth. So aspiration uh, happens with stressed syllables for sounds puta and ka. So if you are puta and ka and you start a stressed syllable, you will be aspirated. Okay. So some examples, um, we write aspiration with a little H above the sound to let you know there's a big puff of air. That's the word total. The first sound in total is stressed, total. And so the T is aspirated. That second T in total is not in a stressed syllable, so it doesn't get aspirated. It actually turns into a flap, that little R-like thing is called a flap. It sounds like a D. We'll talk that, about that again in a second. But if we change where the stresses are, actually, so when al becomes stress, like in totality, then that second T actually becomes aspirated. Totality. Totality. And you can feel the aspiration a little bit there. Now you'll notice that first T stays aspirated even though it's not stressed anymore, that syllable. We'll come back to that in a second. Totalitarian, three T's aspirated, okay? Two of them in stressed syllables. Totalitarian, okay? So first T's aspirated, it's not stressed. We'll come back to that in a second. But these two in stressed syllables, both of them aspirated. All right, so problems with aspiration. Aspiration is a pretty good cue for where stress is, but it's not perfect. So the limits are that it only applies to P, T, and K in English. And K doesn't get that much aspiration even when it's stressed. So there are a lot of sounds besides P, T, and K that you can start a syllable with. So it only helps you in a limited number of cases. Other problems are that you always get aspiration of word initially for these sounds regardless of whether it's stressed or not. So you remember some vowels didn't reduce at the end of the word? These guys always get aspirated at the beginning of the word. And so that kind of limits um, how effective this is as a, as a diagnostic. Um, 
in some cases, you can get aspiration in, in places that aren't at the beginning of the word and, and where you don't have a stress, like the K in abracadabra has a little bit of aspiration. Um, it's a limited number of contexts where that can happen, but it still uh, makes it a little bit of a problem. You want to keep track of the time. Okay, so those are the limits of aspiration. Um, flapping is the last kind of diagnostic, and this really lets us, uh, more than being as a cue for stress, it's a cue for stresslessness. So T and D become a flap in English. T and D sounds become kind of like a soft, quick D sound. A flap is like a soft, quick D. So um, if I say I'm going to bring something to you later, that T sound, the thing that you spell as a T and later, that actually sounds more like a real quick D. Later. Later. Okay. Now, you can get that, changing a T or a D to a flap, um, when you have a, an unstressed vowel preceding the T or D, or sorry, an unstressed vowel following the T or D, and really any vowel preceding it. So when you see a flap, that's a really good diagnostic that the vowel that follows after it is not stressed. Okay? But there are limitations on this. There aren't very many exceptions to this. But um, so you see in total, right, that second vowel gets turned into a flap because it occurs between a, um, or it precedes an unstressed vowel. Uh, this T at the end, it would be for totality. It's preceding an unstressed vowel, so it becomes a flap. All right, now some limitations for flapping. Are there only applies to T and D, really? Other sounds do shorten in the same context, but this is where it's most clear. Um, and so, since there are a lot of other sounds, T and D, when it happens, if that's great, and we can tell where stressless vowels are. But if it's not T and D, uh, if it's L or something like that, it doesn't help so much. All right, so then, here's some cases where it would be problematic. A word like perturbation. Okay, and it's spelled out in the IPA there. We have an aspirated P at the beginning, an er sound, a flap, it sounds like a D and then another er sound. Those are the ones we really care about. When we get to the A sound in bay, that's the primary stress. But for the first two sounds, or for the first two syllables, the two R's, we don't have any diagnostics there that can reliably tell us whether those sounds are stressed or unstressed. Right? As far as clear acoustic cues go. Another one is ergonomic. The first syllable of ergonomic. We can't really tell whether that's stressed or unstressed based on the cues that I just mentioned. There's no aspiration there. R is not helpful in terms of vowel reduction. There's no flapping. So we can't tell. So, stress doesn't seem to be any of these things, really. Um, when we look out at the languages of the world, not just English, there isn't any one acoustic cue that we can look at and say, hey, that's where the stress is. Right? It's not always a high tone. It's not always a low tone. It's not always a full vowel. Right? Um, so, despite that, the Oxford English Dictionary is very confident about telling you where the stresses are. How do we know where the stresses are? If stress is not these acoustic cues, how do we know where they go? What is it? Well, um, the current answer, it hasn't always been the answer, but the answer uh, that is dominant in linguistics right now is given by metrical stress theory. And, and metrical stress theory says that stress and accent are manifestations of linguistic rhythm. Okay? So what we perceive when we perceive 
accent or stress is rhythmic structure, right? We perceive a certain syllable as being prominent because it's prominent rhythmically within the word or metrically within the word. All right, so let me show you what I mean. So some of the best, uh, the best way to show this really is um, with clapping or tapping or doing something in time with the word. So uh, if you've attended some of these talks uh, before within the last couple of weeks, um, the one two weeks ago especially, it's easier to do, it's easier to, to perform movements, to coordinate movements um, when you have some rhythmic structure to coordinate them with. It's easier to execute the movements in, in the correct way when you have a rhythmic structure. So if we, if we clap when we say Passamaquoddy, it will be easier for us to clap. The idea is it will be easier for us to clap at the prominent points in time or the rhythmically prominent places. So if we have a word like Passamaquoddy, and I ask you to clap five times. Does anybody want to do it? <laughs> That's one of my students. They're not going to graduate. <laughs> if you clap five times, passo ma quadi. There's once for every syllable. It's pretty easy. Okay. Passamaquoddy. Once for every syllable. Pretty easy. If I were to ask you to clap four times, that would be hard. We have a limited amount of time. I mean, you try it if you want. Try to clap four times and see where, how you would do it. Or three times. I can't do it myself, but you might think I'm faking it. So you can try to convince yourself that it's hard to clap three or four times while you say Passamaquoddy. Once we get to two times, though, it's easy, right? Because there are two prominent places in Passamaquoddy. You say Passamaquoddy, right? That's not hard. That's really easy. It's really natural. If we only do it once, the best place to do it is on qua. So Passamaquoddy. It's not horrible to do it on the first syllable, Passamaquoddy, because that's also pretty prominent. But the most prominent place is er, is qua. All right, so let's try a few more, because um, this is fun. All right, so if we do revolutionary, how many syllables in revolutionary? Six. So let's start off with six, and we'll see. We'll just clap six times. Revolutionary. Revolutionary. That's pretty easy. No big deal. If we were to try to do it five times, that's not going to work too well. If we try to do it four times, that also would not work too well. You can try it, on, you can try it now if you want. You can go home and try it. But once we get to three, then it's not too bad, right? Where is it? Who wants to do it? Yeah, good. So here was um, six times. Here's three. That works pretty well. Now if we want to do two, can we do two? So the most natural place, if you were going to do two, would, would be the first two accented syllables, actually, for that one. Revolutionary, and then just leave the last one off. That's not too bad. Okay? Oops. And then if you were only to do it once, it would be on the loo. Okay? Last one, maybe. Reconciliation, also six syllables. If you do six times, reconciliation. Okay. If you do it three times, reconcil oops, no. reconciliation. Okay, you know when you do it wrong. If you do it twice, 
Where? Reconciliation. All right. Okay. Twice. And if you're only to do it once, on the A. Okay? You getting the hang of it? So, one way to detect, um, this isn't perfect either, but it's really good. One way to detect where the prominent places are, are by finding spots where it's natural to clap at different rates. Right? If it's natural to clap on those places, it's an indication that you have something rhythmically prominent there. Okay, so let's do, um, let's just look, because we found these were hard before. Oh, before we do that, let's go back up here. I just want to point out that what we did here was a little more fine-grained than what was in the OED. Because right, we were able to distinguish in long enough words between primary, secondary, and tertiary. So if you look at reconciliation, the most prominent thing is the one with the highest column, the syllable that we clapped on most often, right? That's A. The second most prominent is the, the second highest column. We clapped on the initial syllable, re, the second most, right? But here, si, and this is also prominent, it's not unstressed, but it's a tertiary stress. It's even less stressed than ra, or less prominent than ra. So we could create something even finer grained than what um, you get in most dictionaries. Okay, so. <coughs> perturbation. With perturbation, we have four syllables. If we were to only clap twice, where would it be? First and third. Okay, so it turns out that that initial syllable is stressed. The initial syllable is stressed, the second syllable is stressless, even though they have the same vowels. Okay, and the primary stress is on bay. Ergonomic is really very similar. So here's four syllables. If we were to clap twice, it would be, again, the first and third. Clap once on the third. And that's the structure. Okay, so. Good. So that, that um, the idea is, for metrical stress theory, the idea is that what we're perceiving then is we're perceiving, when we perceive stress and accent, we're perceiving the rhythmic structure or the metrical structure of the word. Okay? Not always a clear acoustic cue, but it's a structure, and we can perceive those prominent points in the structure. Uh, in that abstract structure. English actually is marked pretty well, but uh, in some languages, this, the clapping is really about the only way you can tell um, where the prominent points are. All right, so these little guys that we've constructed um, here are called the me metrical grids. And metrical grids are something that We've stolen so much from music in metrical stress theory, and they have stolen so much from us that it's hard to tell who stole what. I think they had this first, the metrical grid, OK? Um, but the metrical grid is an abstract structure. The, the pulses at the base level of the grid, so they're supposed to be a, a series of isochronous, equally spaced pulses. And that forms the base level of the structure. These little x's all represent like equally spaced points in time. Now to construct a grid, if this were you know a nice grid like we might see in music, um, typically then we would add another level, give it some more structure. In this case, we've reduced it, the number of entries or the number of points by half, or we've doubled the length of the duration between the prominent points, okay? Now, if we were to put this into measures, that would be, that could be a representation, say, say the bottom, bottom pulses are quarter notes, 
then this could be 2, 4 time. All right? If we give it more structure, like this, so we add another layer where the durations are twice as long between the prominent points, and we put this into beats or into measures, then this could be a representation of 4, 4 time. All right? Typically in 4, 4 time, although you can do it other ways, the first beat is the most prominent, the third beat is the second most prominent, and then the um, second and fourth are not prominent. Okay? Except for the drums in most American popular music, then it's on two and four, and the two and four are most prominent. All right, but this is pretty standard for most of the stuff that we hear in Western music. Okay, so the metrical grid is something that we can use to represent prominence in time. And so that's what we use to represent the prominence in um, prominence relationships between the syllables in spoken language. Now, we could use other things besides the grid. I just I do want to point this out because there's nothing magical about this. So you could use just a string of numbers. All right, and in fact, um, uh, I have a couple of students who are running some computer simulations of the perception of meter, and this is how we encode meter, just as a string of numbers. Okay. They're both here. That's Patrick and, and Catherine. You can wave. Patrick and Catherine are doing that. And this is, this is pretty much the same thing as the metrical grid, but it's easier for us to put into a computer. So one just represents relatively not prominent, and then two more prominent, and then three even more prominent. See, and so it matches up to the grid like that. We could also do something like sine waves. Okay? So this corresponds to the base level of a grid. The peaks in these waves are equally spaced. Here they are twice as far apart, the peaks, and then twice as far apart again. Now we could add these up, starting with the base again, and then we could add another level where the peaks are twice as far apart, and it would look like this. That's what the sine wave would look like. And then we could add another level where the peaks are twice as far apart again, and it would look like that. And that corresponds really well to what a metrical grid is. Okay? Now, we see uh, people do use sine waves, people do use numbers. There are reasons that we use the metrical grid um, in metrical stress theory instead of those other options. And the reason is mostly that it's easy to formulate nice, simple rules about how rhythm in language works when we use the metrical grid. So, um, let's just quickly look at some of those reasons. So if we have a word like legislators, its rhythmic structure is like this. Legislators. Primary stress on the first syllable. If we have a word like Mississippi, primary stress on the third syllable. We put them together, Mississippi legislators, now, when we put the two together, rightmost is more prominent. That's the way it works in English. Unless you have a compound word, then the leftmost is most prominent. But if you just have regular phrases that you're stringing together, the rightmost is most prominent. So it will look like this, Mississippi legislature. And we can clap this out. All right? So if we clap, uh, I won't try to clap it out every time. For every syllable, that's just too much. But let's say we clap it out for the next level of stresses. Then we get Miss, we get, how do we do it? Mississippi, no, I'm doing it every syllable. Mississippi legislators. Did I do it right, Catherine? Did I do it right? Okay. Mississippi legislators. If I do it twice, then I would do something like Mississippi. Mrs. Oh, Mississippi, Le that's not right. That's embarrassing. Sorry, Mark. No, I'm kidding. 
All right. So um, what's happening here is an uh, important rhythmic principle in English. And this is called clap. That's a song by the Clash, in case you didn't get that one. Okay. So the principle of Clash, Clash is um, Clash is a rhythmic well-formedness principle. This is the definition of class, and the principle that makes things rhythmically well-formed is avoiding this situation. So, um, class occurs when any two entries on level X plus one of the grid do not have an intervening entry on level X. So, let's give you some examples of this so really quickly so that we can learn what class is. So, here's the base level of the grid. There can't be any clash here because we don't have two levels. We have to have at least two levels to have clash. So here is a second level. That's going to be level X plus one. And then level X is right below that. This doesn't have the levels or the entries on the second level don't have an intervening entry on the next level down. So we have clash. That's not good. Okay. Now, if we move them apart so that there is an intervening entry on the next level down, this is better rhythmically. We don't have clash here. This is fine. All right? So I'm going to add a level. Clash or no clash on the third level. Clash on the third level because there's no intervening entry one level down. All right, how about now? Clash on the third level? Yeah, still clash on the third level because there's no intervening entry one level down. Good. So now, how about, oops, sorry, clash, yes. How about now? No, now the clash is gone. So now we have clash, or now we have clash avoided, no clash. We do have an intervening entry one level down. So what clash avoidance does is, is keep prominence from being too nearly adjacent relative to the next level down. So sometimes it insists that things be further apart. Sometimes it insists that there be more structure on the next level lower. All right, so let's see what this does for us. Mississippi legislators clash. That's why we can't clap this out. So here's the clash, maybe. There it is, right there. We have two entries that are adjacent on the third level without an intervening entry one level down. So what do we do? Well, here's what we do in English. We take the entry that is most prominent on C, that's the most prominent syllable of that word, se, and we move it over to me. Okay, me is the right height. We can just move it over. And now we have no clash. All right? Now those two entries on the third level do have an intervening entry one level down. So now this becomes easy to clap at that level. So we get. Mississippi legislators, right? Now it's rhythmically well formed. This is how we say it. Now this is called the rhythm rule in English. And what it does is it insists that when we combine words together like this into phrases that they are rhythmically well formed. It tries to improve them rhythmically. Okay, so let's give you one more example. This one's kind of fun one because it has lots of things moving around. So we have a uh, hundred. There's the word hundred. The first syllable more prominent than the second. So its metrical grid looks like that. We have another word, 13. In this case, 13 is actually a little tricky because it depends on the context. So in most contexts, that second syllable is going to be more prominent, 13. If you put it in a list, like 
13, 14, 15. First syllable. This isn't a list, though. So the second syllable is going to be more prominent. We put these together, 113, it will look like that. The right one is promoted because right things are more prominent than left things in English. And we get this, 113. We're going to add one more word. Minutes. Prominent on the first syllable. Okay. We add that in, 113 minutes. We promote it so it's more prominent because it's the thing on the right. Now, right away you can see that we have clash. So this is not how we actually say this word in English. What happens is we see a clash here and we move that entry on the third level over to the first syllable of hundred. We still have a clash, though. We take, there's the clash. We still have a clash. We take that first entry in the clash and move it over so that we avoid clash. And so the resulting structure of this is really very different than what we started out with. So um, we have 113 minutes, right? Very nice rhythmically, even though that departs from the basic rhythm of the word or the basic rhythm of what the phrase wants to be. Okay? Good. All right. So um, that's kind of technical, but it's fun. What you're probably asking yourselves now, you could just be focused on the fun of that. There was lots of clapping. There was stuff moving around. <laughs> Lots of fun. And you could just focus on that, but you might be thinking in the back of your head, why bother? <laughs> why? Why does language need this rhythmic structure? I mean, grocery lists have this. It doesn't even have to be poetry. It doesn't have to be lyrics to music. Right? Just regular old language. You have an argument with your mom, you have an argument with your kid, it has this rhythmic structure. Why does language need this? So, um, let me just briefly tell you about how speech sounds are made. And this is a... Uh, Here's a picture of the vocal tract. It's easier to see where things are. Um, that's an MRI, I think. Uh, less easy to see where things are, but you can, you can get kind of an idea. So what happens when you make a speech sound is usually air kind of, you get a bunch of air in your lungs, comes up out of your lungs, and the first place where that air can do anything is, is right here. This is the glottis, it's the vocal fold. Sorry, I'm banging the microphone on it. The vocal fold and the glottis, they're housed in the larynx. Um, in men, this sticks out. It's called the Adam's apple. And what happens is if the vocal folds are closed, then pushing air up through there will make them vibrate. And if they're open, then they won't vibrate. And you can feel the difference here. So if you take your hand, everybody take their hand. This is fun. And you go your vocal folds are open when you do that, so they're not vibrating. You do zzz. Now they're vibrating. Zzz. And you go back and forth. It's really entertaining. Zzz. Okay? That's the first chance that the sound has to get modified. And it's an important difference. So most vowels are voiced. Uh, a lot of consonants aren't. Um, that's one of the main distinctions uh, between consonants is whether you have that vibration with your consonant and not. That's actually, for example, the only difference between K and G, or the only difference between S and Z, the one that we just did, whether or not your vocal folds are vibrating. But then what happens is there comes up here, 
and it can go through the oral cavity here or the nasal cavity or both. And what determines whether that, ha which of those options happens is your velum. Your velum is the soft palate and that's mobile. It can raise and it can lower. Everybody know what the soft palate is? Okay, all right. So if it's raised, the airflow to your nasal cavity is shut off. It can't go through there. If it's lowered, air can flow through your nasal cavity. So if you take your hand again and you do something like, uh, uh, there's no vibration there in your nose, right? It's because your velum is raised. And so there's no air flowing through your nose. But if you do something like, mm, mm, you feel that? Velum is lowered, air flowing through your nose, so you can feel the vibration. All right, so um, the other thing that we'll, we'll modify has a lot to do with what kind of sound you get is the position of the tongue. So if I put my tongue, if I raise my tongue really tightly, shut off the airflow right behind my teeth, I get a sound like t. I really like t. Feel where the tip of your tongue is? T. If I make a sound further back, I raise the back of my tongue up on my velum, and I do the same type of thing. K. K. If I just ignore my tongue, if I let it flop down in my mouth and just close my lips, P. Now those are all the same sound except for where the closure is made. All right, that's the only difference between those sounds. Other things that happen are sometimes your lips don't just close, but they stick out. This is called rounding. So if you make an E sound, E. If you make an O sound, O. Put your, do this. This is important. This is really important. <laughs> e. O. Good. You feel the difference? All right. Now, when you make speech sounds, you have to do all of these things at the right time. Otherwise, it's just noise, okay? It might be just noise anyway. But <laughs> if you don't, for sure, it's just noise. Okay, all these things have to happen. So if I want to make a S sound, my tongue has to come up and it has to hit the alveolar ridge. But it can't be too tight because air has to flow through. My vocal folds have to be opened. My velum has to be raised because I can't let air flow out through my nose or it's going to be the wrong sound. So all these things have to happen at the same time in order for me to make the s sound. If I want to make the n sound, my tongue is going to stay in basically the same place, but the closure is going to be complete. The vocal folds are going to be closed so they can vibrate. The velum is going to be lowered so the air can flow out through my nose. If I want to say sniff, I have to transition from one to the other really, really quickly. And I have to do that over and over and over again when I talk to get into these different configurations. So this is fun little video that I found on YouTube. I don't want you to think I spend lots of time on YouTube. I don't. <laughs> this is a fun little video I found. And this is a video made. Um, at USC, um, they have this, uh, they're getting a, a database of emotional speech, and they're doing MRIs of this emotional speech to see what it looks like, to see if there are differences in how your tongue moves, how your jaw moves, and so on. And this is really cool. They have the passage that they use um, for this. So you'll hear this passage maybe four times here. It's not that long. Um, you'll hear the passage four times, and it's called the Grandfather Passage. And it doesn't make complete sense, um, but it contains nearly all the phonemes of English. The exception is, I think it doesn't have uh, which is a really important phoneme, but it's not in the Grandfather Passage. Okay? So we'll hear this a few times. Um, here is, can everybody see this? Your larynx is right here. Your vocal folds are in here. Your velum, it's not always easy to see. It's going to be roughly here. You'll see it raise and lower. The thing you will see most is this tongue moving around. 
like crazy. Okay? Especially the faster you get it, the more this tongue is going to bounce around. And it's not just that it changes position, but it changes shape. All right? So it reaches forward. It scrunches up and moves back. It's amazing, really. The lips will pop in and out. Okay? So we'll just watch a, f a few of these. Um, they're not long and, and let you get an idea of what's going on. You wish to know all about my grandfather. Well, he's nearly 93 years old. He dresses himself in an ancient black frock coat, usually minus several buttons. Yet he still thinks as swiftly as ever. A long flowing beard clings to his chin, giving those who observe him a pronounced feeling of the utmost respect. When he speaks, his voice is just a bit cracked and quivers a trifle. Twice each day he plays skillfully and with zest upon our small organ. Except in the winter when the ooze or snow or ice prevents, he slowly takes a short walk in the open air each day. We have often urged him to walk more and smoke less, but he always answers, banana oil. Grandfather likes to be modern in his language. You wish to know all about my grandfather? Well, he's nearly 93 years old. He dresses himself in an ancient black frock coat, usually minus several buttons. Yet, he still thinks as swiftly as ever. A long, flowing beard clings to his chin, giving those who observe him a profound feeling of the utmost respect. When he speaks, his voice is just a bit cracked and quivers a trifle. Twice each day he plays skillfully and with zest upon our small organ. Except in the winter, when the ooze or snow or ice prevents, he slowly takes a short walk in the open air each day. We have often urged him to walk more and smoke less, but he always answers, banana oil. Grandfather likes to be modern in his language. You wish to know all about my grandfather. Well, he is nearly 93 years old. He dresses himself in an ancient black frock coat, usually minus several buttons. Yet he still thinks as swiftly as ever. A long flowing beard clings to his chin, giving those who observe him a pronounced feeling of the utmost respect. When he speaks, his voice is just a bit cracked and quivers a trifle. Twice each day, he plays skillfully and with zest upon our small organ. Except in the winter when the ooze or snow or ice prevents, he slowly takes a short walk in the open air each day. We have often urged him to walk more and smoke less, but he always answers banana oil. Grandfather likes to be modern in his language. You wish to know all about my grandfather. Well, he's nearly 93 years old. He dresses himself in an ancient black frock coat, usually minus several buttons. Yet he still thinks as swiftly as ever. A long, flowing beard clings to his chin, giving those who observe him down. a pronounced feeling of the utmost respect. When he speaks, his voice is just a bit cracked and quivers a trifle. Twice each day, he plays skillfully and with zest upon our small organ. Except in the winter, when the ooze or snow or ice prevents, he slowly takes a short walk in the open air each day. We've often urged him to walk more and smoke less, but he always answers, but in the oil! <laughs> Grandfather likes to be modern in his language. Okay. All right, um, so uh, I'll, just, I'll just wrap up. I think that's um, the reason we have, or we think the reason we have um, metrical and rhythmic organization is just because producing speech sounds requires 
a lot of coordination to do it right. I mean, when you you don't realize that when you're just looking at someone else talk because so much of it is just going on where you can't see it, right? When you look at manual communication, you can see it more and you can see the need for a rhythmic organization. But spoken communication, you just don't see it as much, but you can see it here. So what we think um, we're looking at when we see stress and accent is this really kind of low-level timing system that is penetrated into the phonological system of the language and um, can, it, it's always there, but in some languages it penetrates more and it has in English penetrated quite a bit. So it determines what vowels you get. It determines whether you get aspiration or not. Okay? In some languages it's much less noticeable. It could be just um, tiny variations in the length of the consonants. Okay? It could be even less. You could just be expected to get the whole timing system based off the position of the primary stress. So some, it remains just basically that, a timing system. And uh, in other languages, though, like in English, it's penetrated up into the phonology and really affected what vowels we say, what consonants we're saying, where our tunes, where the changes in our tunes go. Okay? Um, so, uh, and, you know, stress and accent can do a lot of other things. They can tell us where words are, where word boundaries are. They can tell us sometimes even um, that we have differences in meaning, like the differences between construct and construct, one a noun and one a verb. Okay? All right, so that's, that's it. That's what uh, rhythm does in, in language, and I hope you enjoyed it. Sure, if anybody has questions. Yeah. How did your graphical location, like we have southern accents and northern, east coast accents and midwest, and northern, 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 uh, more slowly than northerners, so you may have fewer syllables per second or something like that. As far as the stress and accent patterns go, there, there can be some regional variation, right? There can be some variation between dialects, so I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, most of the country says police. Sometimes in the south you'll hear police, and that's, that's a shift in, in where the stress goes. Um, so uh, there's, there's also some differences in stress between American English and British English. So in American English, we'll say uh, garage with the stress on the second syllable where it's supposed to be. And, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, that's just a really bad thing for a linguist to say. <laughs> um, in British English, the the, they'll, they'll move the stress to the initial syllable, garage. No, but I'll tell you, I'll, she doesn't say that, but I'll tell you one thing she does say. This is my oldest daughter, Maria, daughter number one, Maria. Um, she's the one that loves me the most because she's the one that came to my talk. <laughs> but she literally loves me more than anything, you know, than, than love then it's possible to love anybody, literally, literally. <laughs> so she has that thing where literally means not literally. <laughs> Anything but literally, right? That's, that's not so much a, a rhythm thing or stress thing as much as a meaning shift. It's like fake news or something like that. Um, that happens all the time, yeah, normal. Um, what aspect? Just rhythm? Yes, or, yeah, what we talked about earlier. 
Yeah, so if, you, if you're interested in looking at it from a more technical perspective, there's a great book by Bruce Hayes called Metrical Stress Theory, and that's where I start all my students on. I hand them a copy of this book. I used to have a dozen copies of this book, but so many students don't return it, I think I have two left. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great book. Um, Henry Biggs was here earlier. Where did Henry go? Is he still here? He may have snuck out. Um, Henry uh, it teaches our computational linguistics class. Bruce Hayes was his dissertation advisor. He was uh, great, one of the great metrical theorists. Yeah, it's one of the things that can change, certainly. So stress patterns can change over time. So if you look clear back in English, um, back to Anglo-Saxon English, the primary stress was word initial or root initial, right? Um, now it's shifted to where it's more often near the end of the word, usually within three syllables of the end of the word. Sometimes it goes back to the fourth syllable, but not often. Um, so it, it is something that can change over time. Um, it changes, it can change when you uh, borrow things. Um, it can change uh, just as part of random change that always goes on. We, we often change the stress pattern of words when we, we borrow them from other languages. So we have a lot of borrowings from Spanish where we'll change the stress pattern. So. The, the name Jose in Spanish has stress on the second syllable, the last syllable. When we say it in English, we say Jose stress on the first syllable. This is really annoying to people named Jose. <laughs> they're usually pretty Jose. They're usually pretty polite about it, though. Um, but yeah, so different languages have different rules about how they borrow things. We will, um, at least currently, in American English, change stress patterns. That's one of the things we change um, to make it more American English-like. But the rules can also change over time. What you what you do when you borrow words can change. That's just that's just a, a fact about language. Everything changes all the time. Slowly, usually, but it changes. Well, we have the word minute and minute. Uh huh. Stress often can be used to, to signal a difference in meaning. Now, it doesn't, it, some languages use it more than English. English uses it a little bit to signal differences in meaning. Um, usually, though, you, if you sig use it to signal differences in meaning, it's, it's less effective at signaling differences in word boundaries. Um, if you use it to signal word boundaries, you won't use it to signal meaning. Um, English uses it a mixture. It doesn't, so it, for, from most perspectives, it doesn't do either really well. Um, but what, what stress always does, um, I think, is, is signal the rhythmic pattern of the word. It always does that. And it can do these other things more or less well in different languages. Um, hmm. No. Um, there are some that are more common than others. So uh, trochaic rhythms, trochaic meaning um, grouped in units where the stress or where the, the prominent part comes first, uh, are far more prominent or far more common than um, rhythms that are iambic, where the, where the prominent element comes second out of the two. Um, there seems to be reasons for that as far as rhythmic organization goes. It could be a, a historical accent, accident. There are certainly languages that are iambic. Um, but it seems that languages like to have their initial syllables stressed and they like to leave their final syllables stressless. And iambic rhythms, um, iambic rhythms, it's, it's hard to do that with uh, uh, and so it, it, they could be less common just for that reason. 
uh, as well. So there are rhythmic reasons that they might be less common, particular to language. Uh, it could also be historical accident that they're less common. Um, uh, well, they can uh, they can affect our ability to, to speak a lot. So language is implemented in the brain. Um, it's distributed in different parts of the brain, um, different aspects of language, and so you can kind of selectively damage um, certain parts of languages. Like you might damage reading but not writing, or you might damage the ability to process speech coming in without damaging the ability to get it going out. Now, um, rhythm is not something that is specific to language. Language seems to have some of its own principles, um, rhythm-wise. But overall, lots of things that humans do involve rhythm. Um, one thing that I, I thought was interesting, the, the talk two, two weeks ago, um, I, I've always just kind of assumed that your same basic structures underlie both. Um, the, the talk a couple of weeks ago had pointed out, though, that sometimes you, you lose the ability to, to speak well without losing the ability to sing well. And um, so I'm not, sure exactly what it's, I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. I would think those would be hurt at the same time. So maybe it's even more distributed than you might think. Yeah, it's a good question. We still don't know a whole lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And burning calories. <laughs> Megan Rose. Tom Vance and I. Yeah. Uh, when you were talking about the metric grids, there was a point at which you briefly put off the sine waves to mm -hmm. model it. Um, in doing that type of analysis, do you see any, like, in natural languages, their tendency or a certain periodic structure to emerge, or certain frequencies like overrepresented? Um, no, the ones I would be most familiar with would be uh, speech rate. That It seems to vary a lot. Uh, there's a range. It seems to vary a lot from person to person. It will vary a lot. You saw it vary a lot just with emotion, right? How many syllables were going by per second. Um, and I don't think anybody really has a good handle on what the average rate is for English of syllables going by. So um, I've, I've seen estimates of six syllables per second. That seems pretty high a lot of times. Um, I've seen four and five. So probably six, seven on the high end, four and five on the low end um, for just kind of normal everyday talking back and forth. Um, but, yeah, I don't know that anybody has a good handle on what's normal or typical. There's a whole lot of variation. One more question, maybe. Thank you all for coming. All right. Thank you. <laughs>